welcome to our Siyum of Sefer Shemot. A Siyum is a celebration where we finish learning a book of Torah. Today we are finishing the book of Shemot, or Exodus, which we started in the fifth grade. Please enjoy these presentations about the work we've done and about each of the parashiot we learned. Good morning. We started off learning the first parsha in Sefer Shemot, in which all of the Israelites come down to Egypt with Jacob. It mentions all of the tribes that traveled with Jacob, listing them one by one. It then states, Vayamot Yosef v'chol achav v'chol hador hahu, meaning Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. The Torah talks about the multiplication of the Jews and their fertilization as a people. The next line states, Vayakom melech hadash al mitzrayim asher lo yada et Yosef, and a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. After reading this line, we were curious as to what this really meant. We looked at a series of commentaries and explanations, hoping to grasp a better understanding of this sentence. We started by looking at Rashi's two commentaries. The first one explains that there really was a new king over Egypt, or that he was the same king with new edicts. The second one interprets that the king really did know Yosef, only acted as if he didn't. Another explanation that we immersed ourselves in was Sephora's opinion on this passage. He said that the entirety of the Egyptian people forgot about Yosef and the Jews, and they sent them into slavery rather than it being the king's fault. We would like to offer another possible solution, one of our opinions. A bit like Rashi, we thought the text was talking about the same pharaoh, not a new one. Contrary to Rashi, though, this is a one to erase Yosef and bury his legacy as a savior. The new pharaoh who did not know Yosef was not literally a new pharaoh, but a pharaoh whose views had changed. He did not want Yosef's impact to outshine his own, and therefore chose to forget him. Overall, we enjoyed this project and found it an immersive experience into a prominent Jewish text. We owe this all to the amazing educators who have mentored us through this three-year journey. The midwives and the baby boys being thrown into the Nile River by Audrey, Shoshana, and Naomi. In fifth grade, we learned about B'nai Israel's slavery in Egypt, as well as Pharaoh's plans to kill the baby boys of the Israelites. We were taught about those who helped B'nai Israel save their children and how they were saved, as well as how the killing of the Israelite boys took place. When they were asked by Pharaoh to kill Israelite babies as soon as they were delivered, the midwives did not follow the orders, instead saying, the evil women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous. Before the midwives can come to help them, they give birth. They saved many Israelite boys this day, and we owe them a debt of gratitude. After the plan does not succeed, they start throwing the baby boys into the Nile River. Egyptian guards collected every male baby from the households of the Israelites. After they took the babies to the Nile and threw them in, they would be eaten by crocodiles or them. Also in fifth grade, we were tasked to write a short uh, paragraph about Pharaoh's perspective while all of this was happening. They were incredibly dramatic and included a lot of cursing um, and talking about how B'nai Israel were bad and were going to overthrow Egypt if Pharaoh didn't do anything about um, the situation of their population rising. To this day, we still owe the midwives adaptive gratitude for helping their king to save Israelite babies. The story of the Nile and the babies is a horrific story of the massacre of young children. It is the jo- it is the job of generations of the future, our generations, to make sure something like that never happens again. Top 10 questions we've asked over the years. Number 10. Why did Moshe try to poison his nation by making them drink the golden calf after stopping God from killing him? Get them. Number 9. Why does it say erase twice in talking about wiping out Amalek? What is it trying to tell us? Number eight. Why does it always refer to someone as a son or daughter of a person instead of their actual name? Example, Batparo. Number seven. When it says there was a new pharaoh, does it mean a new pharaoh or does it mean he changed his mind? Number six. Why did God let us suffer in Egypt for so long if we are God's nation? Number five, why is Rashi's commentary in Rashi's script? Number four, why is God surprised by the golden calf if God already knows everything that is happening? Number three, how did Moshe live so long? Number two, 
How did Bene Israel get gold earrings and jewelry to make the golden calf if they were enslaved in Egypt? Number one. Why did it take the Israelites 40 years to get to Israel? His childhood was unlike any other, and this may have led to his lack of impulse control. Though at first glance, it may seem that most should develop this habit after leaving Bene Israel out of Egypt, once one digs deeper, it immediately becomes clear that he has struggled with anger issues for his whole life. One example of his inability to restrain ang his anger is when he killed the slave master. At the beginning of Shemot, Moshe did not have a connection to Bnei Israel, and after killing the slave master, he fled from Egypt. Instead of facing the consequences of his actions, Moshe runs away. This shows how Moshe is not connected to Bnei Israel. But then God reunites him with Aaron and the rest of his family, and he finds ties through the community, through his brother, sister, and mother. God shows Moshe a burning bush and explains Moshe's destiny, and this gives him ties to God. Then God shows Moshe that people are counting on him to rescue them from backbreaking slavery, and Moshe creates ties with the people. At the beginning of the book, we see Moshe kill the slave master, and at the end, we see him breaking the luchot. These two actions may seem similar in the sense that they showcase Moshe acting irrationally in anger. However, these actions couldn't be more different. In my opinion, when Moshe hit the slave master, he was acting out of emotion. He had no real connection to Bnei, and his motive for killing the slave master wasn't rooted in empathy for the slave or a revolt against Bnei's captors. It was simply a moment of rage that Moshe acted on. When Moshe broke the luchot, his actions still stemmed from anger. However, that anger was rooted somewhere. Moshe didn't just feel simple anger, he felt disappointment and betrayal by the people that he trusted. Moshe's connection to Bnei Israel helped him grow as a person and ultimately gave him more control over his emotions. So yes, I do believe that Moshe has changed as a person. I think that his connection to the community did not hold his anger back, but it simply eased his power to be used at the correct times. To me, this is progress, but not good enough. Yes, Moshe has gained a little self-control, but it is nowhere to be found in some of the instances where it matters most. When you behave badly, saying, well, I used to be worse, is not an acceptable defense. At this point, while Moshe's personality has undoubtedly gone through a great amount of development, you cannot truly say he has changed, as time and again he resorts back to his old habits and never seems to learn from his earlier mistakes. After decades of helping people get a better life and getting nothing in return but disloyalty, disobedience, and complaints, it's no wonder that Moshe lost it every once in a while. After all, he is human. Project on storyboard that. In fifth grade, we started learning about Parshiot Vayera, Bo, and Beshalach. In these three Parshiot, we learned about the ten plagues. These ten plagues finally convinced Pharaoh to let Bnei Israel leave Egypt. Without these 10 plagues, we might still be in Egypt. What were the plagues? Dam was when all the water that Egyptians drank turned into blood. Svardea was when there were frogs all over Egypt. Kinim was when all the Egyptians got lice. Arov was when a, was a swarm that affected the Egyptians. Dever was a highly infectious disease that killed all the Egyptians' livestock. Shrin was a rash that affected Egyptians and their livestock. Barad was heavy hail. Arbe was locusts that attacked the Egyptian crops. Choshech was when all the Egyptians could see was darkness, while the Israelites could see perfectly. And Makkah Pechorot was when all the Egyptian firstborn sons died. First, we were assigned to groups and a plague. Next, we studied the text about our assigned plague. We translated to and commentary to better understand them. We then went on to storyboard that and recreated the story with images and captions. Thank you. Thank you. This is our sixth grade Yam Suf project or Project Yam Suf. After the 10 plagues, Moshe and Bnei Israel left Egypt. When they went toward the Red Sea, the Egyptians chased after them on their chariots. And Moshe used his walking stick to part the Red Sea so that Israel could go through. With God's assistance, the Egyptian army was destroyed as they pursued Israel and the Red Sea closed in on either side of them. We were challenged with the task of depicting different aspects of the text through Pshat and Drash, through Chavruta and partner work. We worked with the partner to create two separate artworks of a portion of the text through Pshat and Drash. 
Four elements of the project would be different in the two paintings based on whether they were showing shot or drosh, and the rest would strive to be identical. Maya and I worked together in sixth grade on this project, and we studied Perek Yodal Pasuk Kafret, which is Vayashuvu Hamayim Vayachasu Atarechev Veta Parashim, the whole Chil Paro Habaim Acherehem Bayam, Loni Sharbahem Adechad. For me and Eva's project, we made pop-up representations about the pshat and the drosh. Like the other projects, there were four different elements between the two of them, A, B, C, and D. Two of these different elements were the amount of horses and light versus dark. On the bottom, we pasted the pasuk. Here are some pictures um, of different representations of the text. And something that was interesting about the project was the stark difference between the pshat and the drosh and the way that that could be interpreted um, through uh, art. Thank you. We were looking at the desert journals that we did in sixth grade. We learned about how Bnei Israel struggled and suffered in the desert, how they had lack of food and water. And then we created new personas for ourselves. We gave ourselves pets, we gave ourselves family, friends, and then we wrote journals um, and from our perspectives. And then every morning for a couple of weeks, we would um, get a thing on the whiteboard that would say like, you found water. And then we would write about it. And so our first example is from day nine. And um, this one is called Big Mountain Small Granny. So this is when Bene Israel was feeling doubt about um, themselves leaving from Egypt. The next diary entry is from day 13. So Ariella Klugman, she wrote this, and day 13 is when B'nai Israel was feeling a lot happier, and really, I think they really believed in God and believed in Moses, and they were in Elim, that's the place where they had all the dates and water. They've been walking a lot, and they don't have any food, they don't have any water, it's been a long time since they've um, been near the date trees in the water. So here is an example of Eden's diary entry um, from today, 13th. Now on the same day, Eden did a little bit of foreshadowing in, her th um, in hers where Moshe will hit the rock. And this is an entry by um, uh, Naomi Steiner. Um, as we said, we created our little pets for ourselves. So Jerry was my pet. Jerry was my pet pig. And we got very creative with it. And I think that this project especially just gave us a the right amount of learning with the right amount of um, fun and creativity. Um, and before we close, I just want to add one other thing in. Um, reading this, all of these entries back a year later after so much has happened, it's really fun to, you know, kind of jog that old memory of us uh, sitting in Tanakh, um, you know, writing stories about chickens and, and pet rocks and goats and sheep. And it's, um, yeah, it's really nice. Thank you for listening. The top five Midrashim and commentaries in Shemot. So the fifth Midrash that Eva and I decided to do was from Shemot Ted Dalid. So this Midrash says that during the Dever plague, some really desperate Egyptians sold their animals to the Jews, and they thought that that was their way out of not having their animals die. So some context for this Midrash is basically that uh, Jews who owned animals during the plague, their animals wouldn't die, but the same couldn't be said for the Egyptians. So this trick that some of the Egyptians used didn't work, and animals only survived unless one of these Egyptians like genuinely sold their animals and didn't plan on taking their animals back after the plague was over. So the fourth commentary that even I did was from Shmot al Kleb, and the Deborah Machil is Asher Lo Yada. So in this pasuk, the new king of Egypt says that he didn't know Yosef. So Rashi contradicts this and says that the king actually knew about Yosef but pretended not to know him. For the third commentary, uh, this was in Shemot Chet Gimel, Vayalu et Swardim. So this commentary was by Sforno, who interpreted the word Svardea, who mean crocodile instead of frog. So according to Sforno, the second plague um, was actually swarms of crocodiles. 
At this time period, crocodiles were a danger to human and fish alike nearby or in the Nile. So this claim isn't entirely baseless. The second commentary, Shmot Lamed Bet Aleph Ki Boshesh Moshe. So this commentary was by Rashi, who believed that on the 16th of Tammuz, Satan covered the world in a blanket of misery, darkness, and confusion. So Bnei Israel were very worried and scared, as they had the right to be. Um, and to finally push Bnei Israel over the edge, uh, Satan told them that Moses had been dead for the past six hours, combining the blanket of craziness, darkness, confusion, etc., that Satan covered the world in, and this new information. Ben Israel lost hope and turned to worshiping idols. The first uh, commentary that we decided to do was was from Shmot um, Membet Tet. So basically, uh, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer believes that the babies were actually cast that were cast into the Nile didn't die and that they were thrown out of the Nile um, without the Egyptians knowing. And instead they were taken care of by rocks and basically fed them honey and milk and became their parents. Thank you. For our sh Shemot Siyum, we decided to do the 10 commandments project from, from sixth grade. We decided to depict each commandment using storyboard that. For the first commandment, it's I am Hashem, I am Hashem, your God. And so we're showing that there's like a picture of like God, which is a cloud representing it like that. And it's showing that the other clouds you should not um, look at and you should only look at God. And so for the second commandment, it's you shall not have any idols. And it's showing a family and friends bowing down to idols, but we put an X on it because God said you're not supposed to do that. But the third commandment is do not say Hashem's name in vain. And for the fourth commandment, it is remember the Sabbath. For the fifth commandment, it's honor your mother and father. So I decided to show this by a little girl saying to her parents, I'm going to respect my parents since they are being so nice to me. And since God said so, and the parents look really happy that the little girl's respecting them. And for the sixth commandment, it is, you shall not kill. For the seventh commandment, it's do not commit adultery. For the eighth one, it's do not steal. In this um, picture, there is a robber stealing candy from a candy store. For the ninth commandment, it's do not be a false witness. And the last commandment, it's do not covet or do not envy. Um, and this one is two uh, men or playing um, like a video game or something. And one of the guys is not saying this out loud, but he's thinking about, you know, that PS5 and he wants to steal it. Thank, Thank you. you. We decided to do our project on the Mishon project, which was a past project that we did where everybody got into groups and picked a artifact from, or Kli from the Beit Hamikdash that they wanted to do research on and we made a diorama and shared it with the class. First we learned about just Mishkan in general and then we learned about our specific Kli that we chose in our groups um, and then we started decorating our box and we watched a video giver at Chelsea made to understand what to do and then we wrote a paragraph explaining our Kli and the sacrifice and then we built our Kli um, inside of the Mishkan that we already decorated. And then we did people and other accessories and touch-ups, and then we filmed a flip grid. People worked in groups and had to work hard to read the Pesukim and translate the Pesukim to understand what we wanted to present. While they translated, they looked at Safaria for research. Most groups chose different things to research. Most people shared I mean, people shared their work with the class. So we all got an opportunity to turn about what everyone did. It was also posted on Flipgrid so people could take a look back and see it. Um, the project. Um, the Mishcom project was really fun. We all enjoyed working in groups that we chose. We especially enjoyed researching and then getting the chance to learn about other people's research and got to learn and understand more about them. Here are the top five things we learned about the golden calf. Five, they made the golden calf out of their own jewelry 
from the children, wives, and the men. Number four, Aaron admitted to Moshe that he was the one who collected the gold by making the golden calf. Number three, Bnei Yisrael made the calf as a replacement for Moshe as a leader, not necessarily a replacement for God. Number two, Moshe destroyed the tablets because he was so mad at Bnei Yisrael that they made the golden calf. Honorable mentions. Before we get to the first one, we'll do the honorable mentions. Moshe defended Bnei Israel when God said he wanted to destroy them. Number one, when Moshe found out, he melted the gold of the calf and grounded it up into golden dust. Then he mixed it with water and ma made Bnei Israel drink the melted gold. It is customary at a Zoom to read the end of the book we are finishing and immediately begin the next book to show there is never a break in our learning. We will now hear the last pasuk of the book of Shemot. <laughs> During the day, God came before the Mishkan as a cloud, and during the night, he came before the Mishkan as a pillar of fire, and he was in front of all of B'nai Israel throughout wherever they went. At Asiyum, it is a tradition to recite the Hajran, which is a tefillah that expresses our excitement about finishing a book of Torah and thanks Hashem for the opportunity to learn it. Please rise and say it along with us. Hadran alach sefer shmat ve hadrach alan. Datan alach sefer shmat ve datach alan. Lo nitnashe minach sefer shmat ve lo titnashe minan. We will return to you, Sefer Shmot, and you will return to us. Our thoughts are on you, Sefer Shmot, and your thoughts are on us. We will not forget you, Sefer Shmot, and you will not forget us. Not in this world and not in the world to come. May it be pleasant to you, Hashem our God, the words of your Torah in our mouths and in the mouths of your people, the house of Israel. It may be that we and our children and our children's children will all know your name and learn your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Hashem, who teaches your laws. Modima nachnu lefanecha arunai lohinu, shesam tachilkenu meyoshvei beit hamidrash. We are thankful before you, Hashem, our God, that you gave us the opportunity to be among the people who sit and learn Torah. Yehi ratzom lefanecha arunai lohinu, keshem she azar tanu, v'sayem sefer shmot, ken tazrenu lehachil svarim acherim ulesaymem, milmodu lelamed, mishmor velaso ulekayem, Et kol divrei Talmud Torah techa be'ahava. Shalotam mush Torah mipinu umepizarenu v'zarazarenu ad olam. May it be your will, Hashem our God, that just like you helped us to finish Sefer Shmot, so too you will help us to start other books and to finish them, to learn and to teach, to guard and to do, and to keep all the words of the Torah with love. Adonai oz la'amoyiten, Adonai yivarech et amo v'ashalom. Hashem will give strength to the people. Hashem will bless the people with peace. Yitgadal v'yitkadash shemei rabba. Balma divra chirute v'yamlich machute v'chayichon v'yamachon v'chayi d'chol b'yit Yisrael v'agala v'yizman kari v'yimu amen. Yehei shemei rabba mevarach le'olam u'le'olmei almaya. Yitbarach v'yishabach v'yipa'ar Ye Tramam, ye Nase, ye Tadar, ye Tale, ye Talal, Shame de Kudasha Brechu. The Ela mean Kol Birhata, Vishirata, Tush Behata, Venehamata, Damiran, Balma, Vimru, Ame. Al Yisrael, the Al Rabanan, the Al Tami Dehon, the Al Kol Tami De Tami Dehon, the Al Kol Man Daskin Beraita. Di Vatra Hadain, the Di Vacholatar Vatar. Yehe Lahon Uchon Shlama Rabba. Chena v'chista v'rachamin v'chayin arichin u'mezone raviche u'fur kana min kadam abuhon tevish maya v'ara v'imru amen. Yehe shlama raba min shemaya v'chayim aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. Ose shalom v'imru mav u'ya se shalom aleinu v'al kol Yisrael v'imru amen. You may be seated. We will conclude by reading the first pasuk of the book of Bamidbar, which is the next book we will study in depth. Fire the bear, I don't know. 
Bimi bar sinai bo halo ed be had la chodesh hashenim bashana hashenit let's say tam me eretz yisrael lemor. On the first day of the second month in the second year following the exodus from the land of Egypt, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting, saying. Thank you to all the teachers who taught us. So like I'm excited to continue following the Israelites' journey. Like that we're gonna take like all our knowledge. Find different meanings in the text. We got to get in the mindset of somebody who actually did escape from Egypt. And like learn about the different commentaries. I think Rashi script for me was pretty difficult when we started learning it in around fifth and sixth grade, but now uh, I think I've improved. I think we've learned a lot of different ways to look at the text, and I have a very good understanding of not just what the commentators think of that shmup, but also we've had chances to think about our own opinion, so that's been fun. But I'm just very excited to continue following the Israelites' journey. It's been so interesting so far. Thank you for joining us on our journey through the Sefer, and we cannot wait to continue on our study of the Torah.